but let's get some grammar terms down so that we can work comfortably and quickly through these questions. These are some of the things that they're not going to directly ask you about on the GMAT, but you should be comfortable with to manage the grammatical issues that are addressed on sentence correction questions. So nouns, verbs, prepositions. Prepositions are especially uh, important on the GMAT when it comes to idioms. Idioms which are just sort of arbitrary uses of English language that are just that way because they're that way. Those are some that you'll just have to memorize and we'll help you out with a list of some of the idioms that are really useful. Conju conjunctions, conjugations, I was about to say, conjunctions, which join words, phrases, or clauses. Pronouns, very uh, popular issue on GMAT questions are pronouns uh, and noun uh, and their antecedents, verb and noun agreement, and we're going to jump into a bit of that today. Clauses and phrases uh, and gerunds, which are uh, nouns that uh, sorry, verbs that act like nouns, and we'll see some examples of these here. So let's take a picture and, and, and take a look at how these work in the real world. So a noun can be a person, a place, a thing, or an act. So here's a person, this man, I think it's a man. Um, we have the Taj Mahal, definitely a place. We have a pond definitely a thing. So here we have this beautiful picture of the Taj Mahal with this person standing in front of it and this person must love standing. They look like they love standing. So in this sentence this person loves standing. Standing is a verb acting as a noun. The verb there is that they love, to love. They love what? They love standing. So these are the ways that nouns can work in uh, uh, on the GMAT or in English grammar, that is. Verbs are action or existence words that tell us what nouns do. So we see this tree fell, right? The noun, the tree fell on the car, on being a preposition. So let's talk about prepositions. They describe the relationships between a noun and another noun or verb or adverb. Outside the Taj Mahal, in front of the pond. So this person is outside the Taj Mahal and in front of the pond. So these are prepositions that tell us about the relationship between nouns and other nouns or verbs and adverbs or adverbs and verbs. So here's a little diagram that I use to help remember uh, how the different tenses uh, are going to work uh, in terms of just instead of remembering their definitions, remembering where they exist on a timeline. So if we have the present right here, if this uh, dash is, uh, if this line is used to represent present, we have our tenses sort of laid out here. So we have present here. We have the past, which is on this side of the present, and we have the future, which is to that side of the present. So what is past perfect? Past perfect is when something occurs, so this rectangle is in past perfect, when something occurs and finishes in the past before something else that occurred in the past. So the rectangle occurred and completed before the Pentagon so it is in the past perfect. The present perfect are for, ob are for things that began and ended in the past. So I have been to France. Uh, is not that I went to France, but I have been. It's an action that started in the past and completed in the past. Future perfect the circle is in the future perfect because it is something that occurs in the future before something else that occurs in the future. So the circle is occurring before the triangle so it is in the future perfect. Future perfect can also be used for things that begin in the past and continue through the present into the future. So these are all useful 
uh, ways of remembering how, if you can memorize this diagram, uh, how that works. And um, also, it was a good website, English Page, I think is what it's called, dot com, which has a lot of resources that you can, uh, and some examples of these sorts of things that you can access uh, pretty quickly. So let's just go over a couple of more things that people have t uh, typically uh, some tough times remembering just to make sure we understand these and sometimes people have, uh, can't remember whether they use us or we or they use me or I or me or I and we're going to take a look at some examples. So would we say us students like the teacher were very cold or would we say we students like the teacher were very cold? Well just ask yourself if you take out the like the teacher, what would you say? Us were very cold or we were very cold? You would say we were very cold, not us were very cold. So let's get rid of this one. This is what we would say. We students, like the teacher, were very cold. Let's look at another example. How about Bill and me get along well or Bill and I get along well? Well, we just can ask ourselves, forget this bill part, would you say me get along well or would you say I get along well? You wouldn't say me get along well. So we can go with Bill and I get along well. Great. How about he gave the bill, the ball, oh, sorry, he gave the bill to Bob and me or he gave the bill to Bob and I? Would we say he gave the bill to I? We wouldn't. We would say, he gave the bill to me. So let's get rid of this one. He gave the bill to Bob and me. So these are, by asking myself these questions, I can help uh, remember whether it's me or I or we or us. And that's sometimes a quick trick to uh, double check my thinking and answers on the GMAT. So these are the question types that appear on the GMAT. And over here on the right, you'll see the tags that we use in Grokit to uh, represent these types of questions. So when you're doing your homework or you're practicing, you can use these tags uh, to correlate to the question types. Uh, there are agreement questions. We're going to actually take a look at some of these today. Agreement on the GMAT can have to do with pronoun and noun agreement or noun verb agreement. We're going to take a look at these in a little bit more detail in a moment or so. Misused words on the GMAT are diction issues, um, words that create confusion and or words that are appropriate for that situation. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It's like using words like which for people and uh, whether or not that's appropriate. Style issues. Answer choices that are wordy, imprecise, or redundant are not good answer choices. I can get rid of them because of their style problems. Uh, consistency or parallelism, which is uh, keeping consistent in how you use your pronouns throughout a sentence, uh, and also making sure you're not changing verb tenses inappropriately. Idioms, like we talked about, are sort of arbitrary uses of language in English and more often than not they have to do with prepositions and how prepositions are used with other words. Verbs in time which are verb form or tense and conjugation issues so how are verbs used in time past perfect per, uh, present perfect future perfect simple past simple present simple future. Modifiers which are logical predication and modification. So how do phrases and clauses modify the, the, the things that are near them that they're supposed to be modifying and the GMAT likes when you keep those things very tightly uh, put together. Uh, also comparisons where we're making sure that the comparisons we make are logical and we're comparing similar things, apples to apples, oranges to oranges. So there's a lot of information on this page. We're going to spend a good deal of time on each of the issues so we can sort of see these examples. But we can really 
sort of categorize the different questions that the GMAT presents us on sentence correction uh, into these uh, different categories. So what do we do to tackle the sentence correction questions? We're turning ourselves into a GMAT robot. Uh, robot rules. We're looking for the best answer. Another way to think of that is the answer that sucks the least. And there's not always just one error in a sentence correction question. There could be several errors. I don't know if I can recall finding sentences that have four or five errors, really, uh, because then the sentence uh, just sort of falls apart and becomes nonsensical and obviously incorrect. So one to three errors per sentence correction question that we're dealing with. What's our process that we're going to do over and over? The first thing we're going to do is check our gut. And this is an interesting point. Not go with our gut because the GMAT is designed to trip us up if we're just sort of picking answers intuitively because they know how we go about picking answers intuitively and quickly. So we don't want to just go with what our gut says, but we want to check our gut. It'll, it can help us. If we get a sense if our, uh, that there is some sort of grammatical issue, we can at least check that out and vet it and see whether it is actually an issue or not. So check your gut to see if anything seems wrong to you. If not, it's okay. There's still plenty of stuff to do. But if so, check your gut as in check and see if what your gut is telling you is actually an issue on this sentence correction question. Good. Then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to check the answers. What we're going to do is look for patterns in the variations of the answer choices uh, to help us identify which issues are being tested on this sentence correction question. A lot of times you'll see two answer choices one way and three the other way, the two, three split, uh, and that'll help us ID uh, questions that are issues on the, uh, that specific sentence correction question. And then lastly, we're going to narrow down the possibilities we're going to, sorry about that, we're going to narrow down the possibilities. We're going to get rid of wordy and awkward answer choices and we're going to look for, we're going to continue to look for additional errors we had not ID'd while we're reviewing the answer choices. So, like I said, today we're going to work uh, a handful of agreement questions together, both noun verb agreement and pronoun antecedent agreement. And those are the agreement issues that the GMAT loves testing, and there's quite a few of them. So agreement fo uh, questions focus on the agreement of nouns and pronouns and verbs and nouns, but let's talk about nouns and pronouns first. So pronouns must refer unambiguously to their antecedents. So the antecedent is the grammatical term for the word that a pronoun is referring to. If there is more than one male in the sentence, you cannot use he or him or his because we wouldn't know who, which male, the, that pronoun, these are our pronouns, we wouldn't know which male in the sentence these pronouns were referring to. The correct relative and interrogative pronouns for people is whom and whose or whom. So, whose shoe is this? Uh, who is that? For non-people, we use the word which. It's important to never use the word which to refer to people. We use the words who, whose, and whom in the interrogatives. Prediction allows us to quickly eliminate some answer choices. So, let's take a look. Found on several Indonesian islands, Komodo dragons dominate their habitat and grow to lengths of up to 10 feet, running swiftly enough that deer and wild boar serve as its primary live prey. So in this situation, we can see that we have a noun here, Komodo dragons, Komodo dragons dominate their habitat and grow to lengths of up to 10 feet, running swiftly enough that deer and wild boar serve as its primary live prey. So 